Let's see. And Chris Sloan can't make it, but his kids are ready to get more feedback on their essays. Nice. So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, we have a few and powerful group tonight. <laughs> welcome, Jessica Early and um, David Cole. And um, we promised everyone, and I think we're going to go through this and, and see how it goes, um, to look at, I, I, I've made them four. There may be, we'll see how many there are. The numbers get a little fishy here. You'll have to help us with that, Jessica. But um, the, the key genre elements of a college admissions essay, um, and in the middle, David, you're sitting right on top of it, if you don't mind moving a little bit one way. There we go. In the middle, we have the introductory paragraphs um, to that. And if you click on that, it'll go to now comment where the article is, and you can kind of follow up and annotate it there. But then there are four picnic tables. And I'm, I'm propose, I spent some time putting together, um, pulling some AI um, templates um, on, on Youth Voices. Um, that we've used before that were had similar uses and then took some language from the, the text itself and tried to see what that would do. So I can show you all that. You all can play along as much as you'd like. Um, so you'd need Paul, to get logged Paul, into the, youth, youthvoices.live. Yeah. Paul, is that the same? Are you referring to the same kind of thing you were doing before where you walked us through running AI for certain... Um, learning partners and so forth. Is that what you're referencing, or is there another exploration? So we're going to tool? use. I, you weren't here when we. Maybe you were. Uh, we, I wasn't yeah, here last few weeks, but the week before there was one where. So we're gonna we're gonna use Youth Voices um, and yeah. AI Mojo. I think you saw. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I did. That's what we're gonna play with today. I mean, okay. interestingly, I think the prompts work in both places, but yeah, yeah, so. But they are slightly different too. So, but let's check in with you. How are you? What are you thinking? What's going on <laughs> with you and AI? Me or life in general? Um, <laughs> with yes. Me and AI. I, I continue to get. I continue to stay um, very interested in the idea of a writing coach. Um, and like I think I mentioned last time I was here, I, I continue to do some research and spend time in. Um, listservs that seem increasingly to be about cognitive science and how a assistants need to have native kinds of empathy if we're going to hold students attention and approach them thoughtfully as learning partners or mentors which writing teachers do habitually so there's an, an astounding amount of native understanding and insight from the NWP community, for example, which is one of the many reasons I love hanging out with writing teacher, writing project teachers. So it's fascinating to think about, and it gets back to that idea of improve, of supporting the writer versus solely improving or primarily improving the text. Um, mm -hmm. And I continue to be very interested in that. And I don't know, I did manage to speak to someone associated with a group called the Learning Agency, which the writing project had partnered with on a Kegel uh, feedback prize exploration of assisted feedback tools, um, which was a computational algorithm exercise to develop algorithms and data sets to help do automated um, writing feedback. Notably, the writing project had commented that I understand that, hey, we want to help writers not just improve the text, which I think is the credo of the community, mm -hmm. one of many. And um, I spoke to one of the data scientists at the learning agency that had been one of the facilitating organizations for that feedback prize work and explained what I was thinking about and learning with conversations like this. And she said, yeah, that would be quite interesting. And anyway, it was very helpful to get some orientation. In terms of nuts and bolts, one thing she said, she said, you know, it would be very good to put together reinforcement learning with teachers. And I kind of said, I thought reinforcement learning as a protocol had a lot of overhead to it. And she described a way to sequence that, which is basically a professional development convening, as I imagined it. So it was helpful feedback. So um, I'm going back to some of so, the technology introductions that I used to do and in thinking about pacing around these things. That's what I'm doing, Paul. 
not all, not full time, but that's what I'm doing. Cool. Now, Jessica, you mentioned that you have and have were you able to check on your your work computer. You might have more of the fifty essays that you referred to. Actually, in this paragraph, it's right here in the center. Um, do you do you have those somehow? And David, you need to help us think how that's going to work um, a little bit. Uh, we don't have time tonight to kind of break it down, but in general, if if Jessica had had a, a number of essays, how would that work? Is the question. First of all, Jessica, were you able to find them? And yes, I have. I don't have all fifty, but I have. Mm -hmm. Um, and I haven't, ca I apologize, I haven't Hi, counted them all, but I have some. Hi, Bob. Doesn't matter. Um, hey. My only question, I have to check with IRB because I got, I collected those under that IRB and I have to make sure it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, to share, I think it would be because they're totally anonymized and, um, but I just have to make sure. Jessica, these are 50 examples of college essays that students have written in your under your supervision or in your classes? No, we collected these prior from all different, like students who, I correct, I collected them not prior to the study, but prior to my like part of the study where I was teaching and doing the intervention of the teaching um, in order to create and figure out the genre elements that are repeated patterns. Does that make sense? Mm, yes. Um, so anyway, so, I don't have any problem handing them over, but I just want to make sure it's okay with, in terms of data sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm totally willing to, if it is. And, and David, I, I came upon and did, didn't get it to you yet, but a one company that says, you know, give us 10, 10 documents and we'll help you. Sure. You know, train, and then and then you can just take your your open AI feed and train it through that. I don't I don't know how that works, but do you think this is worth doing? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, it seems it would seem to be very useful to take a collection like what you've got, Jessica. Given the, I mean, there's a there's a taxonomy that you bring to that collection that a lot of us here on the call and others would recognize that would define a level of expert terms and figuring out how to even understand that in the context of an AI. I, as part of what, I, what I'm learning again is that this so-called fine tuning has everything to do with mm -hmm. just getting busy as you've been doing, Paul, and as you're suggesting to say, here's a collection, this collection is defined by these sorts of themes and topics. As expert teachers or facilitators, we're seeing this set of prompts potentially guiding some that the ingestion of this stuff along the lines of what you've been thinking about for the notebooks and so forth, but doing it according to some, some frameworks that have to do with outputs and seeing what we discover and seeing to what extent this stuff is serviceable and usable. It, you, we're seeing a lot of services sort of crop up to provide this as value add workflow productivity components to people's jobs, you know, which is to say it could be great or it could be really tedious, but it feels like a really good exercise to begin to play with a collection. Um, because within those essays, Jessica, I imagine there are certain sentences that really speak clearly to, mm -hmm. you know, what would be seen to be very quality, good quality writing or very good quality observation. And those things could be pulled out and they could be created as a kind of filter. Like these are examples of this type of sentence structure or this type of content focus or this type of descriptive quality. So there's a whole bunch of lenses that I think folks on this call and people like us would bring to bear in terms of the prompt models that could be set up. So, and that would be very so useful. You know so what yeah, I do have um, that I could, and I know I can, I also, along with those first, that first corpus that I collected, I have the, I have the essays that the students wrote in the classes, in uh -huh. the after going through this workshop, their mm. final drafts, their rough drafts. Wow. Well, you know, to that point, I mean, again, the pre and post component is a big deal. So even having like if different collections defined what we might think of as a pre and post level of fluency mm -hmm. and we ask the AI to sort of 
draw out elements that spoke to those things as time-based or temporal examples of where kids were. I mean, I think we'd learn a lot in that exercise. I don't know if it would be translatable immediately to a classroom, but I think it would yeah, inform that's exactly what might go. What I was thinking. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think thinking, like, I, how I, far away? Is, how far away from the classroom are we with this? Class? Well, that's a good question. I think. Yeah. I think yeah. it's. I think it's relatively easy for go-getter teachers, like uh -huh. many people who come onto this call, to take an AI experience and put it in the classroom very quickly. Okay. Um, and I don't. I think if the work happened with this corpus that you've got, Jessica. And we could quickly sort of see just whether what looks like a quick win, so to speak, we could turn around and say, all right, how does this translate and think of, think like instructional designers and put something on its feet as a test case. I, you know, I think as educators, we're all especially good at reducing things down to very serviceable but useful bite-sized explorations and designs. But um, so I don't know how to answer that, Paul, but I think we'd, uh, we'd okay. learn a yeah. lot I mean, working it, on a corpus. It's just that we were having the question at the same moment. So, but Bob, yeah. how are you? Welcome. Great. I, I want to see if I yeah. can get my head around what we're talking about, because I, I, I'm also trying to figure Good. out. Okay, it's, it's helpful. Because this, this, this conversation circles around the more deeper work in prompt design that I've been doing. And, yeah. and I don't totally understand the connections, but Yes. Yeah, so can, can I, can I, maybe can I your questions will help. Yeah. Yes. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So here's my question: Is are are we positing that we can through the through Jessica's collection create um, a more intelligent AI that's just instead of giving feedback to students on their submission, that's the ultimate. I'm I'm wondering if we're allowing a, a more intelligent AI because it's not pulling from the larger data set, the large language model. It's just pulling from a, a, right. a defined data set and, yeah. and therefore responding based on what 18 year olds are capable of producing and, and not what I would produce or Jessica would produce because that's what the AI would normally do, but rather based on what students you know, should be expected to or could produce a, a reality-based intelligence that's giving feedback to students based on that in, in, informed perspective. Is that is that the big idea here that we might be dancing around? I like that. I mean, I think it's putting words to what we're thinking. I don't know if I'd thought that yet, but I mean, there is something... exciting to me about seeing what AI does with real student yeah. work instead yeah. of yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that's more applicable to teachers than anything, right? Right. Yeah. And I think we're also students, they're all in order to be in the study, first generation college bound students, most of them are um most of them are second language learner. I mean, I think they're very relevant writing samples for classrooms that teachers yeah. are teaching. And, and, it's, something, and it's, a, it's a corpus that could be added to, is what I'm imagining also. Mm -hmm. um, but so, um, what, what, Paul, there, there's something what, about, I don't think, by the way, my understanding of fine tuning is that it is fine tuning. You're still using the power of that, 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 that you know, that LLM but you're, it's, it's being tuned by your documents, right? But, yeah, see, yeah. When, so when it's we the combination that is interesting. Yeah. Well, when I, when I think back on my classroom days and when we built rubrics based on student work, not based on the adult expectations of that work, but when we calibrated all the indicators to examples of real student work, we had a very, we had a way more effective tool than than the rubrics we came came up with based on our own theory of what you know student work should look like. So this to me is a is a similar strategy to sort of ground truth ground truth what is possible in student work itself, not the larger LM, LMM data set. Yeah, I think if 
if we were able to take a corpus and just and define the prompts around it and set some of the about the, some of the criteria for the AI according to things that we as so-called experts felt would be worth extracting for our own benefit as facilitators and teachers, so to speak, that would be really useful to see if within this, this work, we're finding the stuff that can be identified as valuable or to be improved. I mean, setting a, a bar for that with a, a corpus with, that's defined would be really useful, I think. All right. I will get in touch with somebody who knows how to do fine tuning, like somebody who their business is helping people do fine tuning. Yeah. And we'll see if we can get some advice on this. Um, I think it's all have useful. You, Paul, have you yeah. looked at the have you looked at the fine tuning resource on open on ChatGPT? They've got a whole no. I know got a whole um, sequence there. I mean, it's fairly complicated, but they go through how to. That much I know that it's fairly yeah. complicated. And I wanted yeah. somebody to hold my hand pretty fast. But yeah, 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 that's right. I did. All right. If if you don't mind, l let me show you what I, I've thrown together around um, Jessica's uh, key genre elements. And mm -hmm. we'll, she'll tell me whether I picked the four key ones or not. This, the, this what's in the center of this table here is um, is an introduction to it. Um, do you want to just summarize what you said there, Jessica, or read it, or why don't you just read it, if you don't mind, can you, yeah, sure. um, and, and, you know, interrupt yourself if you want and explain, but go ahead, yeah. Okay. yeah. As mentioned, students work on the second working draft of the essay while receiving instruction, specifically several skill lessons on key genre elements of the college admission essay. Researcher, that's me, and teacher, Sarah Slagle, derive these elements by collecting and examining as many examples as of this type of real world writing for secondary students writing as possible prior to the workshop. A thorough review of successful examples of college admission essays provided insight into some of the most common features of this type of writing. After an extensive online and book search, Jessica and Sarah collected 50 examples of college admission essays from college students who'd applied and been accepted to colleges and universities in Arizona, Maine, California, Texas, Oregon, and Washington. These essays were read and coded to find specific elements and repeated patterns used for this genre. Several elements emerged from our analysis. These genre elements become the instructional focus of the workshop. The working draft of the essay served as an opportunity for students to take part in a process approach to learning about the, the genre. For this draft, students were guided through different steps of writing an admission essay from invention to drafting to revising. So we pulled out these key genre elements and we talked about these last week or the week before. This is sort of the basis of my whole program of research just and where I started as a high school English teacher in Oregon, just wanting to understand how to better teach writing so that students, I knew and I've been embedded in the National Writing Project model and the writing process movement, and, but I wanted to be able to take unfamiliar genres to them, which are most, and make them less mysterious and especially right. high stakes genres like this. And, and, and in the chapter, what comes before this section is work on um, topic, finding your topic and work on audience, trying to understand your audience. And we worked with those couple things for a couple, couple of weeks yeah. prior to this week. Another is like embedding story, embedding dialogue and detail. And then the turning point so, so the four that I picked out here, and and maybe it's three, and and I don't know if well you'll see what I mean, is, um, well the first, the second one is detail, um, the first the first one is is writing a successful introduction, adding detail, and then the so what section, and then the conclusion, um, and those those are four that I thought we could mess with, if that's close, Jessica to your format, I think it is. So um, if you don't mind, come up to the picnic table in the top left with your, with your um, arrow key. Let me get, let me get Bob one second. Bob, you'll need to come up to the left a little bit. To hear us.
There you are. You're here. Okay. Um, if anybody wants to go on and play yourself, you can. I'm just going to demonstrate, and at any point you can kind of do what you'd like. Um, there was a revising um, 08. Oh, oh, let me let me pull it up first. Um, template on Youth Voices, and then I created using your text, Jessica, and the other author, um, the, a genre 05. And I just want to kind of compare those two. Everyone know what we're doing here? I'm going to share screen and we'll get there. Um, you can click on any of those and do this yourself again. Let's see. Let me go here. Oh, that's not where I want to go. Sorry. Let me go out and come back again. Okay, I am using um, Chris Sloan's text that he provided a few weeks ago. Same one, this one about, uh, it now has an introduction to it that uh, uh, the student didn't write, it's here. Okay, um, so I'll show you how this, this works. Um, we're going to edit this post. And please interrupt or ask questions as, like, why are we doing this and things like that as much as you'd like here. All right. Um, I'm now, so question is, let's say, let's pretend for us, well, let's not, one second, one second. Sorry. So I'm opening AMOJO and I'm going in. And I'm picking revising weight. If I can spell it right. Is so this, this is this a student essay or is this something Chris? This is a student essay, yes. Great. Um Yeah, I could get rid of that first. Uh, I'm not going to. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the essay really, it, it was a draft and it had two paragraphs. So I'm going to take those two paragraphs. I've selected the discussion post introduction and we're going to show you what this does. Um, and then we'll show you what the next one does. And then we'll talk about it. Paul, the title of this revision number eight, discussion post introduction, mm -hmm. refers to the fact that what that you're taking the paragraphs after the introduduction. I mean, literally, is that what that means, or is, I mean, is it that I'm not? So let's say it didn't. Let's say yeah, thanks. So let's say it didn't have an introduction yet, and so we're working on the lead or the introduction, right? Okay. How do you how do you help us how how do you help a writer create that lead? Mm -hmm. And right, and again, okay. So we're going to generate, okay. and we'll show you what this one does, and then we'll compare it with what the next one does. So what this does is it creates, it generates a lead for you, right? It, um, it, yeah, it's rewriting what you submitted? It doesn't rewrite it. It, it, it ingests the two paragraphs and then it gives you what it thinks would be a good lead, right? I'll, um, I'll do it again and then we'll read oh. one. Does that make it's sense? Telling you, it's telling you what should precede what you, what's been ingested. That's right. Interesting. Now, so is the, always the question, is this helpful for a writer, not helpful? How do you how do you feel about doing this for kids? How do you feel about them being able to do it, right? Um, this leads goes like this. Do you ever find yourself getting lost in a moment over something you're passionate about? For me, acting and fashion have an enormous hold over my attention. You're probably remembering the essay now, right? <laughs> um, when I'm performing or creating 
imaginary scenes or brainstorming clothing ideas, I get lost in the worlds and I recognize that they are both immensely significant to me. I also take pleasure in the challenge of character creation and running an online fashion business while gaining the knowledge of managing the business. It's truly a great pleasure for me to find something that I love doing in an important way. Now, so how do you feel about students doing that? Or do you, or how do you think I, I, students might react? Or is it helpful? I can't. My first, Not. my first feelings aren't positive. <laughs> <laughs> do tell, Bob. Bob, do tell. <laughs> I, I just, I want, I want AI to ask questions, provide support, um, fill in some emotion, like some kind of emotional. Yeah, I, I, I want a different role for AI here. I don't want AI writing for me. I want AI supporting my process and 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 actually providing emotional not just technical support i agree mm -hmm. you know this right. gets back you know yeah so yeah but, but students are going to have access to this right oh they're i know, I, know this. But yeah. I totally get they're, yeah. Yeah, they're going to go off they're going to go i mean i'm like i'm thinking if i were a student and i had to throw so i just like copy paste man yeah. Send to my teacher Paul. Right. Hope he doesn't run the AI detection on it. I got to go to practice or something. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. But that's not um, what, what our job is to try to come up with an educative experience that we think teachers would uh, use. I yeah. can tell you that a lot of uh, like Bonnie students, for example, would read this and say, "That doesn't sound like me. I don't like that. I don't want that." They're, right. they, yeah, they do that too. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet they'll say, "Oh, I, but I like that third sentence. I'm going to use that." You know, so sure. there, there, there can be a. I think there could be an educative moment where yeah. you compare what AI gave you with what you want it to be. Right. Yeah, I think you know this gets at a pretty complex workflow, which seems really inevitable and really important to grasp. Grasp, grasp, which is, kids are going to have this ability to sort of generate really fluent really gracious text as you just did. And then the question is gonna be, is there a move where they're incented or inclined to simply say, I like this one and this is why I like it and here's how I'm gonna use it. So they're qualifying and annotating their, their synthesis of this information, which is no different than qualifying and annotating stuff we used to do for those of us who grew up with encyclopedias, right? But um, the interfaces and the step process that needs to be in place in terms of expectations uh, and the introduction of that workflow feels like it's as important as anything else that's happened so far. If kids are gonna encounter the text weight the way you just described, Paul, which makes sense, it could. My reaction was just like a distracted student who wants to get onto something else. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah I, I'm, I, I see where you're going with this. So I, the inter yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I hear from Jessica. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. What do you What do you think, Jessica? Is this Is this doing your work for you, or not, in a good way, or not? Or what's your feeling? This is. Re I agree that this is realistically kind of where the first place this is going to go, or mm -hmm. already is. I mean, um, and it's what teachers are most afraid of. Sure. Like, there, I actually, my sister-in-law is a high school teacher in Washington state. And she just randomly texted me a second ago and was like, there's no idea that I'm on a zoom with this. And she said, um, I had an English teacher in my, she's a history teacher, but I had an English teacher in my building flip out on me today because I suggested using AI to give feedback to students on their writing. She had like a full on flip out. Um, so I think that's like, <laughs> <laughs> not your maybe not your typical writing project teacher or maybe so I think there's varying levels of how people would respond to this. Um, yeah. I do think even if we weren't talking about AI and we're talking about any kind of teaching of writing, that there is a really helpful move here that this could help with, which is thinking about the difference, is thinking about what is revision and reseeing a piece. Mm -hmm. And I don't actually think that's something I, to, 
flip it to a positive. I think that's something that would really help teachers themselves to be able to, AI could help them teach and re-see themselves how, how to help students revise. Is that, yeah. I don't know if that, that's where my brain that. went. Well, I think, I think that's it. I think from, I mean, if this weren't a personal statement, I would be reacting differently. But this is a personal statement. And so I really struggle. I'm not denying the reality that kids are going to use it to write their essays. But if we're, you know, pursuing a positive role for AI in this process, it should be about noticing and reframing and suggesting and coaching, not rewriting for the student, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, what, I just what, part of the struggle is part of the struggle is going to be that this template is available, and then the next one I'm going to show is available. How yeah. do we how do we how do we understand how to get students to value the next one, which I hope is more valuable. So let me go to that. This is um, genre. If I remember correctly, oh, oh five, yeah. And I just use the same title as this is one of this is I use one of the um, tables in the chapter. And if you click on the now comment thing there, you'll see that. Let's say this student came with this first paragraph here, right? Mm -hmm. And said, okay, this is my lead. I need some help on my lead. This one we can look at we can look at what the template looks like in, in a second, but let's see what it does first. All right. If somebody else want to read for me, <laughs> just so it's read this, this is not a rewrite. This is a feedback. Template. This is this is a feedback template based on Jessica's chapter. Right. Yep, that's right. Okay, there. cool. Yep. This makes yep. me happy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Want me to read it? Thank you. Yep. I can see that you have put a lot of thought into this essay, particularly in the complexity of the topic. You effectively communicate the significance of this of this task and why it has such a deep impact on you. Your lead does an admirable job of introducing the topic with vivid descriptions to draw readers in. To improve the introductory paragraph, consider developing it further with option one, if you'd like to get readers thinking and considering. Alternatively, option two could help tell a short story that relates your experiences to the, your own experiences to the topic. Option three could offer a small insight into what the topic means to you. So consider a quote or old saying to start the essay. Combining these multiple options could provide an even more compelling beginning to your essay. Should, should have shown the Jessica's chart, um, or the chart that's in the book. But I'm going to generate it again because it can do a better job than that one did. But go ahead and talk while we're doing it. Well, I came up fast. That totally impresses me. Yeah. I mean. And that is what, those are really concrete, clear yeah. strategies for improving writing. And it's mm -hmm. what I would give a student in a writing conference face-to-face. And it's something that's actionable that they can do, and it's teaching, but not in a formulaic, like, it's giving options, like, if you want to do it this way or this way. Right. Well, in your I mean, book, you give little... people three options, right? And, and that's what it's trying to do. Go ahead, David, what were you going to say? Um, it's a little bit of a whiplash, which seems to be exact, always the experience of working with these tools. Um, in the background of these conversations, whenever I'm looking at this, I'm trying to, uh, I'm imagining an interface that somehow holds these different things on the screen so I can think of them as component parts and I could analyze them or at least see them in relation to each other because it just happens so darn quickly to go from, hey, there's some immediately ingested and delivered finished text in my own voice. Should I just use it or what piece do I want to extract from it to suddenly I'm listening to a mentor voice introduce a forking path that I can choose and asking me which one might make sense to me. And the next move is mine as the creator writer person. It's really it's almost like jumping, like 
if we're not on in AI, but it's like jumping into a whole different classroom. Like, oh, that's, that's right. A teacher, different yeah. conversation, different yeah. approach. Yeah. 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 All right. It's um so Paul, as you've moved from we, revising yeah, five to revising eight, and as yeah. the sort of it's you're actually, the designer yeah, genre eight, but yeah. Genre yeah. eight. And yeah. you're sort of the puppet master here. I mean, you're you're designing these prompts which have very specific characteristics in terms of the position they put the the writer or user mm -hmm. in terms of what they're encountering, and it's it's your intent in designing these things to create that experience, right? Like, oh, there's some finished text. I could. How do I feel about it? There's now I'm getting some mentor guidance. Where do so, I sit there? Are you thinking through? Is that part of your design as you're making these things up? So I. What what I'm trying to think is like, so yeah, Chris Sloan and I developed the that first one we saw, right? Yeah. I mean, early on, because a lot of kids were writing blog posts and they didn't have good introductions, and so mm -hmm. you know, sure. you know, let's just let's just do this, yeah. right? <laughs> let's see what happens. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Jill's students, the eighth, the eighth graders, she just says, "Go pick any of them." I want to kind of figure out how we can be a little more careful and say, if you pick that one, you're going to get this. If you pick this one, you're going to get that. Right. And sure. And so, yeah. So that's part of it. Let me show you another one that's similar, but if that's fair, picnic table to the right. Follow me. You use your arrow key, Bob, to come to the right. Okay. Uh, maybe I. Maybe we should all just sit in the same place. <laughs> Hi again, sorry. Uh, okay, I'm sharing screen. Is Jessica coming back, I hope? There you are. Hi. You'll get used to this eventually. <laughs> I went all over the place. I had, okay. a little, okay. I had a little vacation there, sorry. Okay, I think. I think. Yeah, we got yeah, Echo going. Okay. Um, um, Jessica, Jessica, mute, mute until you're ready. Until you're ready, to talk. No, no, I think you may be on in two different places, but that's okay. We'll figure this out. Okay. Um, so this one is about description, and um, Jessica's. I'm just saying you, but I know there's another author too. Um, Jessica's just has people look at their senses and think about vivid language. Um, and I'm going to go through this really kind of quickly, but I'm going to use the same paragraph. I'm going to edit post. And why is it? Oh, there we go. And we're going to open AI Mojo. Let me remind myself. We're looking, at, we're looking at okay so ai mojo creates this it's actually built in i didn't make this one this is called a content expander right but kids could get to it no problem so i'm going to use i'm going to use the content expander And this is actually a pretty typical thing that that GPT does, right? And other ones do too. So I'm going to pick this paragraph, this one paragraph again, put it in here, and I'm going to hit the content expander. Oh no. Oh, okay, I'm just, I don't know what screen I'm on. And it's that same paragraph. And let's see what happens to it.
So this is this is what it does when something makes me lose track of time. It, it does this when I'm completely absorbed in a moment, totally immersed in something. You see, it's adding lots of detail. It actually makes some paragraphs. Kind of does what that first one does again. Any thoughts about this? Is it the same sort of negative stuff or questioning stuff about this one? Please unmute and say what you're thinking. And or is there a moment where you could look at, oh, that's your paragraph. This is what AI gave you. What did AI do? What is it thinking about? No. How you know, do, Paul, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I've mentioned this, this other service, which I like just because of its interface. It divides things in thirds, like, you know, a web page. Mm -hmm. And now it's in two thirds, one third. But the third being, there's original content, there's the AI response in whatever lens it's responding. And then there's a third section where, in theory, the writer or the user sort of does their integration work. And mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking as you're asking me this question, like if I'm suddenly presented with fully voiced original quote in quotes content, and I'm supposed mm -hmm. to have some kind of cognitive response and personal thought about what I didn't think about it. How do I synthesize that new information? I'm looking for a place to go type my response sort of metacognitively. And then to the extent I like section sentence two, as you were saying, and then phrase three at the bottom to say, here's how I would use it. And in some ways demonstrate that I've absorbed it. I mean, I'm kind of doing all that math in my head, but if the- Yeah, you, you know, could I'm, go I'm, over I'm, here on the left side and, and edit, but yeah, what you're saying is- uh, yeah, I think you're, I mean, you've said having that, another yeah. box is useful. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, to your point, yeah. I mean, if in order for me to feel good about the fact that the AI is doing original writing, I'm looking for the space where I'm supposed to. I'm going to feel like my next step is to extract some piece of it, or simply comment on what I'm reading, so that I'm going to have my own thought in relation to it, and then I'm going to sort of string something forward. Now that might be just an interface move. But if that's the expectation on the part of the student by virtue of their peers or the mentor or teacher, and they're just going to find a space to do that, that's great. But I keep coming back to Bob's first reaction, which I had. Every time I look at something where it fleshes it out, especially in first person, as if it were something I wrote, I'm kind of going, I'm looking around to see if I'm stealing something or not. Or <laughs> I'm going to feel like I can go, now I'm going to go actually respond to this and demonstrate that I've absorbed it somehow. And here's my synthesis. And then I feel even more... Then I feel confident as a writer. I'm like, oh, look what I, I've absorbed it. I'm thinking about it. I'm adding to the pile on my very own. That feels like a, an important move. I think That's it would be really helpful. I think it'd be really helpful to develop some guiding principles yeah. for um, mm -hmm. kind of what for the, what for these what, first person yeah, ones. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so what are the what are the principles that are driving kind of what yeah. we would like the relationship to be between the AI and the student? And without that, we're, I mean, it's great, Paul, to see you kind of, kind of breaking all the rules and, and, and just, just in the effort of trying to see what would happen versus let's establish some rules and say, this is, this is the way we would like to see the tool used, albeit, you know, kids can use it any way they want outside of the space. But if we're providing a space, I had this fantasy of the annotations. Did any of you have your writing annotated by a parent or a friend? physically sure all right so my dad did that in high school and he would just read and he would just make little notes and wouldn't it be cool if that's what this generated physical annotations in the text i don't know if that's possible but that would be so cool and then yeah. in the pane next to it would so you only need two panes one with the you know the, the graphic rendering of the of the annotations color coded, whatever. And then in the right pane is where you rewrite. And the last thought I had is, how does the AI get to know you? In a coaching relationship, you, you learn about the student, their goals, their fears, their concerns, their, you know, whatever, before you read their piece. And then you, you provide the coaching. And I think the ability for AI to have emotional intelligence is really exciting, because I think that's where the, the potential gaps for so many kids can be filled in not just the technical and I'll, that's a huge gap, but the actual emotional relationship um, that, that can be brought to all kids as they go through this process. 
And Jessica, did you want to jump in? I'm just you'd sort of like to, you'd have to. I I don't I don't know I don't have a thought to add right now. Okay. Just, okay. 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 That's fine. That's fine. Fine. I'm going I'm to I'm hit. I'm going to hit. Whoops! You got to mute again, Jessica. I'm going to hit generate on this. Um, this is another template that exists. Um, it's a figurative language one. Um, it takes whatever text you have on the left side, and it gives you um, five um, metaphors. It gives you five similes about your text. It gives you five hyperboles. It gives you five <laughs> personifications. Oh, cool. um, and then it gives you five extended metaphors, which you know may or may not be useful to the writer. I'm going to go kind of quickly. Um, and then, so that's one that already existed. And then the, um, and I got to look back at the number here, John Rose six. And then the one is based on, um, in Jessica's uh, text. I'll do it now. Yeah, go ahead. You, Interrupt. Yeah. Yeah, as you do that. Guiding principle number one from the Coalition of Essential Schools. Student as worker, teacher, or AI as coach. If the AI is doing the work, it's breaking the guiding principle. But if they're coaching, it's not. Yeah. Um, so, I, but, yeah. <laughs> so, if you, but, if you give but, but if, if we, if, metaphor, then you've done the work for me. And that would break the, well, the rule. Really? In my opinion, yeah, you're doing the work for me. Well, it's less than it's less than the other one, isn't it? Isn't it somewhere between? I think it is. Let, let's see. Let's see. Uh, go, yeah, let's okay. go ahead and run the test. Let's see so, what it does. No, no. I mean, so yeah, you're doing. You're right, but you're yeah. You may be right. Uh, I won't. Let's see. Let's see. I mean, so, I'm just, I'm just here's, advancing, a, you know, a principle. No, it, no, I know you are. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're using here's here's what um, Jessica's description does. Uh, somebody want to read this for me? So, yeah, I'll read it. Your writing is Thanks. strong and captures the complexity of acting in a vivid way. You also do a great job of showing how acting allows you to explore different scenarios and emotions. However, I think you could enhance your writing by further expanding on the five senses. For instance, you could add more examples of how seeing applies to your experience of acting by including vivid details of what you see when you're acting. You might explore how the camera pans around a scene or captures a particular movement. I think you could also add more details to the other senses. For example, how does the sound of the dialogue or the music in the background affect the way you act? How do the smells, tastes, and textures of the scene affect your performance? By adding more sensory details, your writing will become even more powerful and engaging. So that's coaching. Yeah. That's not that's not doing the work. Yep. So that, just, that, didn't generate, yeah, that didn't generate similes or metaphors. No, no, I'm sorry. I, Different I, filter. I blew through that one. Okay, sorry. You didn't see that one? I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, Paul, one thing that I'm, I keep doing in yeah. these exercises, sort of like running on this as a side bubble, mm -hmm. And this is just how I handle too much information. <laughs> it is yeah. I'm I'm just I'm just thinking like there's so much here in terms of the methodology and the engagement model and Jessica mm -hmm. your your colleagues was it your uh, who was it was it your sister or your a colleague who colleague just texted you tonight sister in law sister in law sister in law you know who's freaking out um, understandably. I'm thinking in, in order to solve all those questions, because there are a lot of questions there. This is my answer. I'm, I'm imagining I've got a semester's worth of time. I've got 69 days, 59, 50 minute periods in a semester. I'm going to divide that up into sixth or I'm, I'm going to devote 10 set, 10 classes to an orientation to the AI which is gonna be deep writing encounter. I'm just trying to figure out how to integrate it into a workflow. But to your point here, Paul, as you're throwing yeah. these different filters, which are doing very different things to our perspectives. It's like, a, it's like if there's a game here. Reach in, grab two filters, well, put your text, set it in touch, come back and tell the class what you learned about these two filters. Do it again, someone that's gonna have those two. And it's gonna rotate and everyone's gonna get used to all, used the, to all the different filters. filters. And, I and have another way that I've, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm getting, getting my echo. I must, I must, have, oh. I must have things double. Go ahead, no, it's go ahead, when Jessica. I talk. I think it's my yeah, microphone. Jessica doubled, Jessica doubled up somehow. Doubled up somehow. Yeah. Yeah. What okay, do I do? It's okay, though. You're, 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 I think you may I think be on, you be on different tabs. Different tabs. Oh, no. Um, but don't worry about but it. Don't if you worry talk, about it. If you talk, you'll be fine. Okay. So um, I see what you're say saying, David, but I also, from like a teaching perspective, I see it as almost like different mini lessons. Yeah, yeah, be, totally. Right? That's exactly right. right. Yep. And they could be co contextualized by the teacher and like give a mini lesson and then practice with this. Without that, it is what you're saying, like what well, whiplash. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The idea that there's a mini lesson that's introducing a different perspective. Each time you do that, you throw these things at us, Paul, which is designed in some respects, it seems, to get us to think about the possibilities of each. Well, but, it feels but, like a mini lesson that I want to correlate but, but, and but, consolidate. But I, I, I'm okay also just setting up AI makes with with the, the ones that we like and say, use these three. Well, that's, right? a, that's a kind and, of lesson, too. I, I mean. Yeah. Let me show you one more, if I may. Sorry, you said I was throwing too much, but uh, let me throw it's one more. It's not throwing too much. It's, and it's, this very, is, it's very okay. provocative in a good way. Okay. So in chat GPT is right here, and it is GP, chat GPT 4.0 right here next to the text. So I'm just going to say, what do you think of my essay? Right? And then I paste my essay in, and I send it. And it comes back with a pretty... Decent sort of analysis, you'll see, um, analysis. Um, and what I, what I want to show you next is that we can create personas in here. And I created a so what persona. And Jessica is, uh, I hate to represent it for you, but it's, it's the moment in the essay when you pull back and you say, hey, this is why this is meaningful to me. And this is why you should let me into your college. And right, it's that so what section. Um, but You'll see that Chat GPT without the persona does a, a nice sort of but generic sounding response to my essay. Fair enough. Then I can go in here and I can use the so what persona, right? And I can say again. my essay, paste my essay in, and send this. And this, again, the way I created the persona was by using Jessica's language for what the so what section does. You know, you have to change it around. You have to say like, hey, give us advice so that, you know, so that you are a, a, a counselor for me with, with a college essay. And, and I want to write a so what section. So it comes up and it says, you've done a great job of communicating your, your passion for acting and fashion entrepreneurship in your essay. You've done vividly described, you've vividly described these interests and consume your thoughts, the consumer thoughts and times. Now let's enhance the narrative addressing so the so what section, where, where you step back from the story and speak directly to the reader. This is where we'll share your lessons learned and often offer a compelling reason for your story's significance. For instance, how does your ability to lose yourself, right? I'm not gonna read all of this. You can get, get a sense. Remember the goal of so what is to, is not just to share your experience, but to connect them to a larger context. You're on the right track. And then I can say, hey, where do I start? Right. So I I thought that chat that this dialogue with with Chat GPT was the better place to go because yeah. Jessica makes very clear that yeah. explaining the so what section is all about that one on one conference that they have with the students. Yeah. So this, this, sort this of feels good, Paul. Mimic that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, let's talk. This, this feels out. good. This feels this feels more 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 conversational or discursive, which I think is important. And I think it's all about 
support and feedback, not doing the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's super cool. All right. All right. So, so spots, here. spots here. <laughs> so one thought is that this, this Kuma space is set up as, as a playground. How do we get other people to kind of, and you know, at what point is it useful to go through the same kind of procedure we just did or, but I don't know, what are you thinking is more important? I would like to analyze the affective language in, in the conversation that we just saw, because I couldn't really track it, but I saw some positive. And I'd love to really get a sense of what emotional support is happening there. Um, that's my interest is more in that space than the technical, but I, I think they're, they're both really powerful. I mean, I think the technical is great. I'd love to hear Jessica's thoughts on, on the role of the affective in this process at some point, but I know I we're... Know we're... Well, what, what you were just saying made me think two things. One, I think it's really powerful. The instances where you put in like the so what and some of the, er the earlier genre things, and it did more than just rewrite it for you or give you similes or whatever the coaching ones, I mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. there is a sense, I mean, we'd have to try it more and I'd have to try it with my own writing. One of the most powerful things about writing is that it's a social process and that students often are only writing to their teachers or sometimes to their peers. And we've said this before, and this gives them another there's something powerful in in getting back what it's saying in there's an instance where i'm like oh my gosh it gets me even though that wasn't me but like do you know what i mean and that is effective like it read this and whatever it is it's ai and it's saying back like the things i wrote and that's really mm -hmm. powerful and that is as socially powerful i mean it may not be as socially powerful as a teacher you love or your dad you know, but it's way more powerful than having no one. And actually way more powerful than many readers and teachers, not to diss teachers who have 150 students a day and can't do this for every step of the way. So I and think I, that gets to I, be effective. There's a like really powerful emotion that can, comes up for me and just seeing this writing, and I love, Paul, that you've used the same essay now two weeks in a row, because I feel like we all know it really well now. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In a way that a teacher knows their students' writing, right? So I think that actually increases my understanding of how that feeling of feeling heard or seen. I just want to say, I, I think in context where you're getting the AI conversation and then you're and then you're having somebody else then then you have then you're taking that conversation to a peer or to a teacher it, it kind of multiplies on itself that way so you know they're not either or they don't you know live in different universes they're in the same classroom right? oh i got that response can you believe what ai said to me you know so I actually think it's fascinating because it goes against the whole argument, like the teachers freaking out about, because they're saying, oh no, we're taking away writings, personal writing. I mean, I know, cause in the very first instance where we were like, mm, don't like that. It's just giving writing that we could take and use, which is going to happen. But in this case, it's actually adding this, a social dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And creating, like, if we believe writing's a social process, it's for real audiences and purposes. This adds an audience. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So well, let's meet back in the same room and play around here ourselves next week. Does that sound okay? So that, and Jessica, you mentioned that um, 
you know, want to do this on my own writing. I think that is a really important experience to have is to, to test these different things out that way. Um, so, yeah. So if anybody's watching this on video and or any of you need more like, wait, how did he get the youth voices? I'm happy to kind of show you at some point. So thank Thanks. you. Any last thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> Just goodbye. Yeah. Good, good. Thanks a lot, guys. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Good night. Everyone. Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye bye.